um, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it is not easy for me to speak today. Losing a mother is a very, very painful thing. My mother left Nairobi when she was alive and she came back in a coffin. Nevertheless, I've been listening to the tributes coming in from Kenyans and those tributes have triggered memories over the last 52 years from my childhood up to now. And two of the qualities that most Kenyans attribute to my mother, I would like to expound on a bit today um, because it is through those memories that I have actually a concise and clear um, understanding of what my mother wished for me and wished for all of us. I recall on Wednesday when we were at, um, at the Requiem Mass at Consolata, His Excellency the President mentioned that my mother was a fearless defender of our family. And indeed she was, she was, she always stood by her husband, she defended her children, and she drew an absolute double red line when it came to her grandchildren. I remember a particular incident in State House in 2003. My father had just become president, and uh, as you know, he was recovering from a a road accident. So the family used to visit him uh, a lot at State House. And I remember one day uh, bumping into an overzealous State House official on the corridors of, uh, you know, on the corridors of State House. And he told me, you know, Jimmy, you, you kids can't be coming here to State House to visit your father how you want. He is the president now. And we were new to State House, so I thought maybe, you know, this is the way protocol requires. So I said, okay, I understand, so what would you like us to do? He said, from now henceforth, I would like you to be calling my office and making an appointment to see your father <laughs> before you come to State House. So I told him, no problem. So I went upstairs, dad was asleep, but I joined mom in the, in the dining room and we were having tea and we were discussing dad's health and other, th other things. And I just happened to mention casually that um, <laughs> there's this official <laughs> who said that uh, David, Judy, Tony and I, we need to make appointments to see dad because now that he's the president, he's very busy. And I continued talking to mom, you know, about what we were discussing. But I could see her eyes changing. <laughs> and she said, Jimmy, just hold on a minute. What did you say? <laughs> so I repeated what I said. And she thought, I could see her blinking, and then said, anyway, leave that to me. You carry on with what you were saying. So the following day, as I visited State House, I noticed there was pin drop silence everywhere. And I have even checked my phone because I was wondering, is it a Sunday or is it a, a public holiday? And I was, as I was walking down the corridor, I met a, f a friend of mine who actually happened to be um, the, the State House official and he was looking, should I say, quite distressed. So I asked him what had happened. Why is it so quiet around here? And he told me that the first lady had called a meeting that morning of the various heads. And she had informed them in what this friend of mine said in a very forthright manner that as long as she was living on God's green earth, there will never be a time any of her children 
would require to make an appointment with a government official to see her father. <laughs> and I remember asking the gentleman, and then what happened after that? He said, the first lady proceeded to ask us if she had made herself crystal clear, and there was total silence. She then asked, would, did, would anybody like to ask a question? And there was total silence. But from that day, uh, but after the, my friend told me that, I passed by this official's office and I asked him, because I already knew what was going on, and, and he asked me, good morning, Jimmy, what are you doing here? I said, oh, like you told me yesterday, I've come to make an appointment to see my father. <laughs> that gentleman literally carried me by my, you know, lifted me and deposited me at the president's office, and that was the end of the matter. What I'm trying to say is that my mother would go to any length, she would climb any mountain, she would go through any obstacle in the defense of her family. But in case many of you think that because we were defended by a very strong mom, we were somehow spoiled brats, my mother took discipline very seriously, very, very seriously. Discipline and strong Christian values. I remember being caned for a long time at St. Mary's. And then one day I went and I told her, Mom, do you know that every Friday I'm being caned at St. Mary's? And in fact, there's one particular Irish priest <laughs> who's very enthusiastic. And I think His Excellency the President knows the priest I'm talking about because I'm told he was quite familiar with also with his cane. <laughs> so I said, Mom, please do something. These, these Irish priests are, are caning me all the time. This was at St. Mary's. And she told me, you know what, Jimmy? You are going to be caned and they are going to continue caning you because I cannot cane you myself and you've become a very naughty boy. Let them continue caning you. And I was like, what, what, you know, what's going on? But needless to say, every Friday I used to wear two pairs of shorts to school. <laughs> and by the way, I, 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 many years later, I, I, I was informed that my my, my brother Tony was never caned in St. Mary's. So I asked my mother about that. And she looked at me with a twinkle in her eye and a, and a very slight smile. And she said, but you know, Jimmy, you, you, you are a very naughty boy. Tony was a very good boy. <laughs> but I knew, I mean, it would take a very brave man or woman indeed to, be, uh, to cane my mother's youngest son. As we continued growing up and uh, we started working and all that, you know, I thought in, when it came to the issue of discipline, my mother, you know, that was it. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a grown man now. She's not going to be disciplining me anymore. I'm not a child. But I remember one day I was in, the office, in my office and she called me and she said, uh, Kibake, I would, want, I would like you to come to Mothaiga. The sooner, the better. <laughs> And like the deputy president said at Consolata, even for me, that was a time of some serious soul searching. <laughs> because I knew very well, and those of you who know my family, when, uh, when my mother was happy with me, she called me Jimmy. When she was really happy with me, she called me Kiraiko. <laughs> but when she called me Kibaki, I knew things are not so good. <laughs> so I went to I went I went to Mosaiga and uh, she greeted me at the door. She had a very beautiful smile, the smile you see in that photograph. But when I looked closely in her eyes, I could see uh, things were not sour sour. So she poured me a cup of tea and she proceeded to tell me in a rather 
or should I say increasingly loud voice, that there's some misadventure of mine that has come to her attention. And she had very good intelligence, by the way. I don't know where she got her information from. <laughs> and she told me that since I was her son, I was supposed to behave with a certain level of decorum and intelligence. Furthermore, since that I, I was her son, I was not deficient in the intelligence department. <laughs> so she expected me to correct that wrong and report back to her by the end of the day. And she told me, if you ever repeat this, whatever, you know, again, your peace of mind will be greatly disturbed. <laughs> so anyway, I, I went and I corrected all that and I, and I called her about, after about two or three hours. And she said, you know, Jimmy, you're, you, you've become a very, you're, you're a very good man. It's these friends of yours who mislead you. <laughs> but ladies and gentlemen, that's the way I remember my mother. She was very firm, but very fair. She was a firm defender of the family. She defended and promoted her, our Christian values. And she even told me that a life spent serving only yourself or your family is not uh, a life well spent. And that's how in 2008 I got involved in a lot of activities in this constituency. And as I got, as, as the more I worked in the constituency, she got to hear about it, and a lot of people were pressuring me to, uh, to run for parliament. So I went to discuss it with her, and she told me something very profound, which stays with me till this day. She said, Jimmy, the way I have raised you, and the values I have instilled with you, they are not compatible with the way politics, or should we say the political arena in Kenya is today. So you go away and make that decision yourself of whether you're going to run for parliament or not. And then come back in two weeks and tell me. So I went and I thought. And I came back to her and I said, uh, Mom, I haven't made a decision yet. Can, I, I, I really can't make a decision either way. And she told me, you know, after giving me that look, of means, you know, why are men so slow to understand the most basic things? She told me, have you been serving the people of Wadaya well for the last four years? I said, yes, I have. I said, do you need to become the MP for Wadaya to, to continue uh, serving the, uh, our people in Wadaya? I said, no. And then, you know, the light went off in my head and it was like, oh. And then she sat back, finally, he's got it. In other words, what she was telling me, every Kenyan has a duty to serve. They have a duty to serve. You do not have to be a politician to serve your nation. <laughs> Finally, you know, I know I've spoken for very long, and I just want to say, out of everybody here, indeed everybody in the country, my mom's death has obviously affected my dad the hardest. But I want to tell you, Dad, we are here for you. Mom left you four very strong children and beautiful grandchildren. And that is her legacy to you. Thank you.